Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Danica, and I just want you, uh, to thank you for coming tonight. Welcome uh, to the Astronomy Open Night at Macquarie University. And uh, now you're going to have an opportunity to listen to our first talk. Um, this is <laughs> Michael Cowley, my colleague. And um, he's a PhD candidate at Macquarie University and Australian Astrono uh, Astronomical Observatory, uh, where he researches supermassive black holes and how they evolved with galaxies over time. Uh, he's also a research officer with Macquarie University Department uh, of Education, and he's involved in a number of outreach activities uh, aimed at raising the awareness of physics and astronomy among young people and the public. Uh, tonight, Michael will be illuminating us about one of the universe's most exotic objects, black holes. So please welcome Mike. And let's hear it so Thanks, Danica. Okay, welcome everyone and thanks for joining me this evening. It's great to see so many of you turn up. Um, I hope you have a fantastic evening and I appreciate you starting with my talk, but I'm sure you'll see there's plenty of other activities out there once you've done here. Um, so, as mentioned by Danica, this evening I'm going to be talking about black holes, but I just want to take a step back first and explain about astronomy and how typically astronomers use light. So they examine light, they analyse light to help understand all the objects that we look at above us in the heavens. And this might include things such as stars, planets, our sun, nebula, even other galaxies. But what about things such as black holes, things that are seemingly dark and don't emit their own light? How do astronomers examine these weird exotic objects? Well, that's what I hope to answer for you tonight as I hopefully can illuminate black holes. Now, I'm going to start with a bit of a history lesson and it dates back 100 years to 1916 with Albert Einstein. And we're going to make our way through particular milestones in black hole physics all the way to the present day where I'll discuss how uh, we find them and what we know about them. But let's start at the very beginning, 1916 with Albert Einstein and it was 100 years ago now that he published his general theory of relativity. And it provided us with our first understanding of what gravity is. And this will play a big part in our understanding of what black holes are. Einstein suggested that gravity is a result of space-time being curved by a massive object. And what you'll see is my little animation that's in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen is showing how a massive object is perturbing that space-time. This is a pretty crude analogy from a two-dimensional point of view, but it shows how this sheet of fabric is being distorted as a massive object gets close to it, such as the Earth. Now, you could probably picture if I was to roll something past the Earth, you could probably see how it would get caught in this funnel and start to roll around. And this is kind of the concept of orbiting bodies as they orbit around. Now, I want you to keep that in mind as we move forward because this is going to be really important as we discuss black holes. Now, on the topic of Einstein's general theory of relativity, it was exactly that. It was just a theory. It was a few years later that we finally had our first experimental evidence, and it came by way of a fellow named as Sir Arthur Eddington. In 1919, Eddington decided he wanted to try and confirm Einstein's general theory of relativity and that warping of space-time. And so what he wanted to do was to take some pictures of stars as they were close to the sun. The idea being that their light path would actually curve as a result of that curving of space-time. Specifically, what he did is he took some pictures of stars when the sun was not there, so during the night time, and then he measured their relative position to each other. What he wanted to do then was take the picture again when the sun was in the way to see if those positions had actually shifted as a result of this curvature of space. But of course, trying to take a picture of stars with the sun up is like trying to observe stars in the middle of the day. So he waited for a special event and he ventured out to this little island off the west coast of Africa until the solar eclipse occurred. Here we had the moon blocking the sun and suddenly he was able to take pictures of those stars. And that picture that you see there is his actual picture that he developed in 1919. He actually developed it right there and then in the middle of this jungle forest off the west coast of Africa. Typically, I'd be a little bit sceptical about someone using such dated processes and developing photos in the middle of the forest but I can rest assure you that this experiment has been repeated a number of times over the years, all the way up to the present day, and it's found to hold true, and it does indeed confirm Einstein's general theory of relativity and the bending of space-time. 
Let's move forward and we're going to jump forward in time to 1964 and I'll introduce you to John Wheeler who was a popular American theoretical physicist. And what John did is he helped bring general theory of relativity into mainstream physics. Up until then it had been a pretty wacky concept. So thanks to John, it's now part of uh, even things like the syllabus now in high schools. And what John specifically stated was that black holes, which comes from this general theory of relativity, is an unimaginably dense region of space that's curved to such extremes where gravity becomes so strong that nothing, not even light, can escape. And you can kind of see that from my little video here where we shine a torch over the black hole, which has distorted space-time so much, and the light gets captured by the black hole. Now, if we want to think about this from another way, if we think about trying to escape the gravity of Earth, we have to go around about 11 kilometers per second. And that's what we accelerate our rockets to, to break free from the gravitational pull of Earth. If we want to try and escape our own solar system, we've got to go around about 600 kilometers per second. That will allow us to break free of the gravity of the Sun. If we want to try and break free of the gravity of a black hole, we've got to go 300,000 kilometers per second. And for those of you who are familiar with that value, it's the speed of light. And unfortunately, it's also the ultimate speed limit of the universe. So that means if anything is trapped into a black hole gravitational pull, it's not going to escape, not even light. Now, it wouldn't be a black hole talk without uh, the famous Stephen Hawking. I'm not going to say too much about Stephen tonight, but just to point out that Stephen's been really critical in helping to try and connect the dots between quantum mechanics and general theory of relativity. So these are two very distinctive theories where special um, and general relativity by Einstein help us explain the physics of the very large. And then quantum mechanics helps us explain physics of the very small. Unfortunately, when you try to join the two together, it kind of crumbles and breaks down. And so Hawking's been on a venture to try and come up with this grand unified theory where you can combine it all together. And he's been really pivotal in helping explain how things such as black holes may even die over time as they emit some of their radiation known as Hawking radiation. But like I said, I won't go too much into that tonight. What I do want to talk about now is where do these black holes come from and I'm going to talk about the birth of a black hole. So as I've got here three pictures of some stars, we've got a low to average mass star which is very similar to our own sun, a slightly um, larger mass star and then a very very large mass star and as you can no doubt see on the right here I've got these things which are known as stellar remnants. This is basically what's left of the star after it's ended its life. So for a low to average mass star like our sun, in many millions and billions of years, we're going to find it will end its life as a white dwarf. If you're a little bit larger, say around about 3 to 20 times um, the mass of our sun, will probably end up as a neutron star. And then finally, if you've got a very, very large mass star, you'll end up with a black hole. Let me have a look at this star in particular, and I'll explain how that occurs. So here we've got a very large mass star. We're going to cut away and have a look inside and see what's going on. What you see inside is basically fusion going on. It's burning hydrogen. And what happens is all of that fusion is actually pushing upwards. It's causing a pressure upwards. At the same time, you've got gravity pulling downwards. Now, for us here on Earth, we're being pulled down by gravity, but I've got the solid ground underneath me, so I'm not going anywhere. But for a sun or a star, you've got this fusion process pushing up. This keeps the star at hydrostatic equilibrium, or just equilibrium, where it's very steady. Sometimes there's a tug of war between gravity and the fusion and what you'll find is that the star will actually increase in size and contract over time. And these are known as variable stars and there's plenty of them out there as well and we see them. But ultimately most stars we find are fairly stable like our own sun, they're at equilibrium. Unfortunately what happens is that fuel process runs out. There's not unlimited supply of hydrogen inside a star so eventually it's going to run out of fuel and you'll find that it's going to, gravity's going to start to win and it's going to start to contract down. Ultimately what will happen is we'll go through another burning phase where we'll start to burn heavier elements such as helium and so then it will puff up again as fusion takes over. Unfortunately there's not enough elements in this star so what eventually will happen is it's just going to run out of elements to fuse and gravity is ultimately going to win. And when that does happen we have a supernova event. A lot of the outside of the star has just been scattered away, but a good deal or a chunk of the mass has just now suddenly slammed into a very small point. If it's a star similar to the mass of our sun, it's slammed down to a white dwarf. If it's a little bit more massive, it's slammed down to a neutron star, which is smaller still. But if it's a very massive star, it's slammed down into something that's really, really small and dense, a black hole. 
So like I've said there, we've got stellar mass black holes. These are black holes that are relatively similar in mass to a star. And they're typically around about 3 to 20 times the, si uh, the mass of our own sun. And that's this little fellow here. But we also know of other ones out there, and they're called supermassive black holes. And these are on a scale of millions to billions of times the mass of our own sun. So these are gigantic whoppers. The question is, and it's an open question in physics and astronomy at the moment, is what about here? How do we go from here to here? Or do we even go from here to here? Some people believe that stars, lots of groups of stars, might collapse into one and form this big one. But some other people believe that it takes lots of little stellar mass black holes to build it all up together. Something that is interesting, and you'll probably hear a great talk about it tonight if you hang around for the gravitational wave talk, was that when we made the detection of gravitational waves earlier this year, it was actually two massive black holes coalescing and merging together, causing these ripples in space-time. One was 36 times the mass of our sun, the other one was 28 times the mass of our sun, and they combined together to give us almost 60 times the mass of our sun. This was the first direct evidence of two black holes merging together to create a bigger one. So it was, I think it was a little bit overshadowed by the detection of gravitational waves itself, because this is a fantastic observation in itself. And it probably provides some direct evidence that we do have all these little black holes merging over millions and billions of years to form these big whoppers. Let's move forward and I'm going to talk about the Milky Way's lurking monster, which was confirmed in 2002. Now, we're located around about here, around about two-thirds of the way out on one of the arms. And as I mentioned before, there's lots of stellar mass black holes. They're littered throughout uh, the Milky Way galaxy. This is our Milky Way galaxy, millions and billions of stars in there. Uh, I guess something that some people worry about is if we're going to be sucked into a black hole. Remember that those stellar mass black holes, those really small ones I was talking about that are around about the mass of our own sun or a little bit bigger, Nothing's really going to happen to us. If this star right here suddenly turned into a black hole, that doesn't mean we're going to be sucked in. In fact, if our star, for whatever reason, just suddenly decided to turn into a black hole, pop like that, we'd probably find we'd just keep orbiting around it because it's the same mass as the star that it originally was there, the sun. Of course, it'd be a lot darker and colder, but it's not going to suddenly just suck us on in. But what about a supermassive black hole? Are they all littered throughout the galaxy here? Well, there's only one, and it's located here, that we're aware of anyway. But again, it's kind of in happy unison with our galaxy. Nothing's necessarily being sucked into it. Everything just works together. But then the question becomes, well, how do we even know that it's there? How do we know there's a supermassive black hole in the centre of our own Milky Way galaxy? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to use a series of telescopes and special adaptive optics to cut through all the gas and dust that's in the Milky Way galaxy and we're going to peer right into the heart of where we believe that supermassive black hole to be. It was first predicted to be there, so let's aim our telescopes in the centre and see what we find. When we get there, what you will discover is there's actually really nothing there. There's just some stars. But the interesting thing is what the stars are doing. If we watch the stars over a period of around about 10 years, we find they're actually doing something quite weird with their orbits. You probably saw that there. That star's orbiting nothing. There's nothing there, yet it's orbiting in such a way that if we crunch the numbers and crunch the math, we actually find that it's orbiting around something that has a mass of a million to billions of times the mass of our own sun. This is what you would call indirect evidence of a supermassive black hole in the middle of our own Milky Way galaxy. And it's really the only explanation of what's interacting with those stars. There's been other ways to detect the supermassive black hole in the middle of our galaxy. Sometimes it does feed on a little bit of material. There has been gas that has been known to be sucked into the middle of the black hole. And when it does that, sometimes it crunches together and causes a little flash of x-rays. And so now and then we see those x-rays as well. So they provide more support to the fact that there's a supermassive black hole in the centre of our own galaxy. What I want to do now is I'm going to uh, ask, well, where else can we find them? Because my research in particular, I look for those supermassive black holes, but I don't look for more in our own galaxy. I look outside of our galaxy, uh, other galaxies way, way far away, all the way back to uh, millions and billions of years in the past. But the question becomes, well, how do we find them? What I've displayed up here is a field of stars. So most of these objects here, it's a negative image, so all the black dots are stars. Most of the stars, uh, or the objects in this field, are stars that are around about 10 to 100 light years away from us, so they're not too far. But there's one object in particular that is 
quite a distance away, and it's this one here. It's known as 3C273. Astronomers are fantastic at coming up with names for things. Now, 3C273 is really interesting because it's a lot further away than 10 to 100 light years. In fact, it's not even in our Milky Way galaxy. It's actually a lot, lot, lot further away. It's known as a quasar. It was discovered in 1959. It's the 273rd object in the third Cambridge radio survey. So there you go, that's where the name came from. So that meant the Cambridge University had their radio dish aimed up at the sky and their third catalogue, they found the 273rd object to be this thing here. And it was classified as a quasi-stellar radio source. So it was detected in radio, but it was quasi-stellar, meaning star-like. It looks like a star. You can look at it there, it looks like a star. But when they looked at the specifics of it and they analysed things like the spectrum of this object, they found it to be 2 billion light years away. And I've put all the zeros there just to be silly, show how many kilometres away it is as well. So this thing is really far away, really, really far away. And the question now becomes, well, how bright is this thing? I'm going to ask for some help from my old physics professor. This is Dr Stephen Hughes from Queensland University of Technology, where I did some of my grad work there. And Stephen's wearing eclipse glasses. And um, uh, I often went out with Stephen when we looked at things like solar and lunar eclipses, the transit of Venus when Venus passed in front of the sun. And of course, he always warned me, Michael, make sure you wear your eclipse glasses when looking at the sun, otherwise you'll go blind. We're going to do a little thought experiment now. What happens if we pick up Quasar 3C273 and put it where our sun is? And then I asked Stephen, Stephen, I'm going to go outside and check out 3C273. Do I need my eclipse glasses? We'll ask him for the answer. He's dead. <laughs> no, don't worry, he's fine. But the reason why that happened is because this quasar is four trillion times brighter than our sun. So this thing is giving off a fantastic amount of light. So much light, in fact, that, yeah, as we saw what happened to Stephen. What I want to do now, though, is we want to have a closer look at all that four trillion times amount of light and we want to see, well, what is it made up of? What kind of light is it? And so, jumping ahead again, we're looking at the electromagnetic spectrum and, as you can probably see, the typical visible light. But just to give you a quick reference, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. Here we have the shorter wavelengths but the higher energy and then we go the longer wavelengths and the um, lower energy. So up this end we have gamma rays which are what come from supernova events, so very highly energetic. We have X-rays which of course is used in medical imaging. Uh, we have ultraviolet light which comes from the sun. We've got our visible light which is what you're seeing from me right now. We've got our infrared light which if you haven't done this experiment before when you go home grab your phone or your digital camera and hold it up to your TV remote and flash it at the camera and you'll actually see that the light that's on your infrared is actually, uh, sorry, on your remote is an infrared light and your camera should be able to pick that up. Next we have microwaves, so when you go home tonight you'll microwave your burrito and then you'll sit down on your TV and watch MasterChef where the radio waves will come in and pump it in and show you something much more delicious than your burrito. <laughs> Let's take this visible light and move it down here. And we've got the same thing, I've, I've written frequency here, but it's still wavelength. We've still got our red to blue light, ultraviolet, gamma rays, and then the other way we go into the uh, radio waves. <coughs> what I've got here is a spectral energy distribution. This is basically something that scientists use to help analyse objects. And in particular, I want to analyse the Milky Way galaxy. So if an alien observer was looking in on our galaxy and decided to take a reading of how bright every one of these points are along here, they would get this little bump. So as you can see, there's a little bit of ultraviolet, there's a little bit, uh, we, we've got quite a bit of optical, and then we've got a lot of infrared. And this all makes sense because our galaxy is made up of stars like our own sun, and this is all the stuff that comes from the sun. But what about Quasar 3C273? What's coming off it? That's it there. As you can see, it's got a much broader spectrum. It's going over a wider range of light, including those gamma rays and those radio waves. But not only that, it's got a lot more light. And it's not just twice the amount. Notice this is a log scale, so this is considerably more light. So not only is this thing four trillion times brighter than our sun, it's brighter than our entire galaxy. And if you haven't guessed it already, this quasar is a supermassive black hole. It's this thing in the middle of a galaxy very tiny space right in the middle of a galaxy and it's causing so much light. So when I asked at the beginning about, you know, do black holes shine, are they being illuminated? Well, look at this. 
4 trillion times brighter than our sun, brighter than our entire Milky Way galaxy. It's a fantastic amount of light. Where does it come from? That's obviously the next big question. And I've got my little animation here to help me out. What you're seeing there is just a star or planet or something that's gotten a little bit too close for comfort and it's being ripped to shreds by the black hole. Whatever, for whatever reason, its orbit decayed and it got trapped. And what you're finding there is due to some complicated physics, it's formed what's known as a cr accretion disk. It's just due to the conservation of angular momentum that it basically forms this disk-like shape of gas and dust. All of this gas and dust is whizzing around at many millions of kilometres per second. And what that is causing is basically lots of frictional forces. So as I've mentioned there, gravity causes material to spiral inwards and frictional forces causes it to compress and it raises the temperature of the material. And if you've ever slammed rocks together, you see sparks and it eventually heats up. It's the same kind of idea, but on a very small scale, lots of gas and dust smashing together and causing all of that brightness, all that four trillion times the amount the brighter the sun. Okay, so multi-wavelength, as we saw before, it spans a very wide spectrum. Lots of light from lots of different telescopes is required to help analyse this. And these are just some of the telescopes that I use personally to try and help analyse what's going on with a supermassive black hole. Here we've got the Magellan uh, ground-based telescope, which looks in the infrared. Hubble Space Telescope, very well known. That one looks in optical and a little in the infrared. We've got the Spitzer Space Telescope and the Herschel Space Telescope, which look at different far infrared regimes. We've got the Chandra, which looks in the X-ray, and then we've got the VLA, or the Very Large Array, which looks in the radio. So by collecting data on this quasar 3C273, and indeed lots of quasars out there, I'm able to analyse and gather all this light. In particular, some of the open questions that I'm looking at is things such as, how do these supermassive black holes form? How do galaxies feed them? And how do they affect their galaxies? That's one of the big ones that I'm trying to answer. Trying to understand, do these things hinder a galaxy's growth? Or perhaps do they help spark life in galaxies by compressing lots of gas and dust to help it form stars? There's lots of energy coming from these things and wind, and they might blow gas and dust together to help them form stars. It's a very open and hotly debated topic in astronomy right now. Okay, so I'm gonna start wrapping things up. So, have I illuminated black holes? Well, I think we found that yeah, they probably have been illuminated, much in the same way that we find a light globe is illuminated by the chemical reactions that's going on in there and the electrons whizzing around. A black hole itself may not be giving off light itself, but it's causing something. It's causing an effect to generate all of this light. Not only that, it's a considerable amount of light. It's four trillion times brighter than our sun, and it's also over a very broad spectrum, ranging all the way from gamma rays down to the radio waves. And of course, we observe and analyse that light to help us understand galaxies and how they evolve over time, such as how are these supermassive black holes formed, how are they fed, and what's ultimately the fate of galaxies. That's all I have time for you. I want to thank you for your patience and watching me. I've got a QR code up there, or it's the hubblesite.org, so aim your camera at that or jot it down. What that is, it's got some more information if you are interested in black holes as well as some activities um, from kids all the way up to high school level. So it's a fantastic resource to help you explain a little bit more about what I have probably haven't been able to convey in the short time I've had tonight. But that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>
I think the one that I showed you is probably one of the biggest swappers out there and it's on a scale of billions of times the mass of our own sun. So if you picture our sun and then you grab a billion of them and you stack them all together and then you squish them down into this really tiny amount of space, you've got an idea on how heavy this thing is. So really, really heavy. So they don't typically have a physical size, but their event horizon does. So the more massive ones actually have bigger event horizons. So what that means is that's the point of no return. So if you go over that line, you're stuck in the gravitational pull. So a stellar mass black hole will have a, a much smaller event horizon, but the larger ones can be something like 100 to 1,000 miles out, so a lot bigger. So yeah. Again, that's the thing inside, all concept of physics breaks down. So I guess people like to say they're like a singularity, but uh, really what they are is just a mathematical concept, I guess. My most recent paper that I published, um, I found around about 650 of them. And they're typically believed to be in the center of most massive galaxies out there. Um, not all of them are bright. So if I was looking at the Milky Way galaxy and I lived in another galaxy, I wouldn't be able to tell that it's there because there's no light coming from it. So the only way I've been able to catalogue them is if they're eating up stuff and causing all of that light. But it is believed that the supermassive ones are typically just located in the centre of those massive galaxies. Wormhole? Yeah. Uh, I think wormhole is more science fiction. I don't know. <laughs> I don't do anything with wormholes, sorry. I, th I think people like to say wormholes might be able to get you from one point of the universe to the other, um, whereas black holes, once you go in, you're not coming out. Yeah, so like I mentioned, Hawking radiation can allow a black hole to possibly die over time. It's a really complicated concept in quantum mechanics and I don't really want to explain it too much, but basically particles that are really close to the event horizon, they form what's known as uh, a particle and an antiparticle, and the antiparticle will get trapped, and that's negative energy, and then the positive particle will escape, and that's positive energy. And this is Hawking radiation, basically it's losing energy, but unfortunately when you crunch the numbers and you look at this Hawking radiation, and how long would it take for a black hole to basically emit all its radiation, it's longer than the age of the universe. So it's possible that once everything's gone, it's just going to be black holes everywhere. Yeah, by measuring those orbital periods using things like Kepler's laws of motions and the understanding of general relativity, you can crunch the mass and see how those stars are orbiting in such a way. You can examine the stars, get an idea of how massive they are, by their type of light, and then looking at how they move and their motion, you can get an idea of what kind of mass this supermassive black hole is. Yeah, I think um, people have talked about the Large Hadron Collider. When it smashes particles together, it might be able to produce these like tiny black holes. Unfortunately, that's the realm of particle physics, and I'm not too familiar with it, sorry. Yeah, potentially. Um, that's if we can control them though. I mean, they'd probably be an enormous source of energy as well, but I don't know, I'm, I'm probably not too keen to sign up to create black holes myself. So. <laughs> so probably the biggest challenge I face is getting telescope time to observe them. Um, so you've got to write lots of grant applications and telescope time submissions to try and get all that time to make all those observations and then analyse that data. And Unfortunately, you can only infer so much with the data that you get. So more data equals more answers. So. I, I don't know if you saw the two black holes that were merging together. What happens if one black hole gets too close to another one, they merge together and they basically join. So it's kind of like two droplets of water. If they get too close together, they join together and they create a bigger water droplet. That's the same kind of deal with a black hole. They actually get too close to each other and they'll join and then they'll create a bigger black hole. So it doesn't really suck the black hole in. They just like to join together and create a bigger one. Let's thank Mike once more.